So today I'm going to have a look at some of the key reasons why the EV driving experience in Australia has started to go down the toilet and primarily due to our DC EV rapid charging reliability and availability. And we'll look at a specific example. So keep watching. So as an example, here we are at my local IKEA and we've got a couple of problems here. We've got a non-EV who's iced the EV charging spot. That's a petrol MG ZS, but they've parked in the EV charging spot. And here's an example of what we're talking about. So I jumped on PlugShare to just see if we had a uh, charger out of action close to where I live. And lo and behold, down at my local IKEA, which is a couple of kilometres away, um, we've got one of the Queensland Electric Superhighways chargers, and as you can see, it's throwing an error there. And I'll put a plug share screenshot up there, and you can see that a couple of drivers have uh, noted that this is out of action and have reported it for repairs. Hi, my name's Greg, and welcome to Electric Car Australia, the LT YouTube channel for those wanting to learn more about electric vehicles and also sustainable living technologies. Please click that subscribe button so you don't miss any of my future videos. And remember, if you're about to take the plunge and buy an EV, and you don't have endless hours to spend trawling the internet and those forums, visit the website below and book an appointment with myself to get some independent one-on-one -on -one advice to help you make the right decisions. So as I mentioned, we're in Logan IKEA. So apologies, it is a little bit noisy down here. It's a Sunday afternoon and they're closing up shops. So we'll have lots of vehicles going past. But as you can see, you don't need to go far to find problems with DC rapid chargers. This is a global problem, not only happening in Australia, but it was really noticeable this Christmas summer holidays. Aussie spent the longest time in uh, EV charger queues than they ever have. And it's not just because EVs are becoming more popular, which they are. Here in my home state of Queensland, out of all the total registrations of EVs, over 50% of those happen in the last 12 months. So the number of EVs on the road is obviously significantly rising, and that is also not helping the situation. But it's not the main game. So the simple answer to why things are crap at the moment is um, Poor EV charger maintenance, spare parts availability, and poor charger location design. However, there's much more that goes into it than that, and that's what we're gonna have a look at today. But before we get into the details, I should explain the type of chargers that we're looking at. So today we're talking about DC rapid chargers. Now these are the highest powered chargers. They're usually about 25 to 30 kilowatts plus in energy output and they provide the quickest type of charge for ED, EVs. They use DC energy, so unlike the AC energy that's in your house, these are direct current. And in most countries around the world, they have either CCS or Chatamo plugs on them. And if you want to know what that is, I'll put a number of links in the show notes and also include a link above this video, um, which goes into the types of chargers, plugs, and what EVs you can use them on. Now, obvious places for these type of chargers are where people need a rapid charge quickly. So things like near highways, uh, main rest stops, service stations, and that type of stuff. Most people do about 90% of their EV charging at home. So the times that you, you use these chargers is usually limited, unless you're a courier or an Uber driver or something like that. But when you want them, you want them to work because you're generally on a road trip, you've got a young family or something in the car, or you're in a hurry and you just need to rip in, get a quick charge and keep moving. Now at this point I'll also mention the Tesla Supercharger because that's made up of rapid chargers and that's probably the best known rapid charger network. You hear people talking about the Tesla Supercharger network all the time. But we're not going to talk about those today. We'll leave that for another video. And why won't we talk about the Tesla rapid charger network today? Well, it's one of the most reliable around the world. Tesla have got their reliability up to about 97, 98%. So you don't really need to talk about issues with the Tesla network. Whereas a recent US study done in the last couple of months said that the non-Tesla networks had reliability down to around 70 to 75%. 
So as you can see, comparing Tesla's network, which is the largest in the world, has about 40,000 global uh, rapid charges. At 98%, it's a non-comparison while we've got other networks down around 70%. So we've specifically mentioned the Tesla network, but this video is not about calling out any particular one network. Most of the networks, if not all in Australia, are having problems with reliability. We'll use an example later of one of the um, network operators, and ironically it is the Queensland Electric Superhighway, the same as the one we've just looked at here at Logan. But as I said, the intent's not to call anyone out in particular, because they've all got their issues. And these are my thoughts, and they're based on my own personal experiences and also talking to other EV drivers, reading social media and blogs, etc. Um, just here today, while I've been recording this video, I've got another frustrated EV driver who turned up five minutes after me and has also had many frustrations recently with the various charging networks and manufacturers. So this is, from my opinion, but based on a lot of other thoughts and discussions I've had. So with all that out of the way, let's get into the detail. Now this is when the, where the fun starts and where things get really complicated. DC rapid chargers generally have a very complex network or environment within which they operate. And that's particularly painful for us end users because we just drive a car, we just want to plug in and as I mentioned before, we just want it to work. We're not interested in all that stuff behind the scenes, but we're going to talk about it today because these are some of the reasons why the networks aren't operating as they should. And that's the number one challenge of a reliable DC rapid charging network is the complexity of it in the complicated interconnected web of companies. So the key ones are electric network providers, real estate owners, charger owners, help desk providers, payment gateway providers, maintenance contractors. Now I bet you didn't even know some of those or you don't want to know but they're all the different groups and organizations behind making the charger work now sometimes all these operations are done by the same organization sometimes they're all different so again that in itself is a complication and in australia there's currently around 18 ev charging infrastructure providers so as i said we're not pointing the finger at any particular one so as we mentioned, there's more and more EVs on the road now and they are installing more chargers as well. But the problem is the charger installs and the maintenance of chargers isn't keeping up with the demand. And obviously the more pressure you put on the network, the harder it works. So it's a bit of a snowball situation. So let's break it down and I'm gonna try and keep this as simple as possible because it does get quite complex. And let's have a look at all those different components. So let's have a look at some of the components. So first up, we've got the electricity supply network providers. So what these guys do as a piece of the puzzle, they provide the infrastructure. So basically the large cables and the supply of energy to the location. Now these guys might have limits, demand limits, overall limits, etc. So they impact on the size of charges that can go in, the number of charges and all that sort of stuff. And the operators or the charger installers work with these guys well in advance to plan all these things but they are a component and they do add to some complexity with reliability next let's look at the electricity wholesalers and retailers so these guys sell the energy to the charger operator so they might have issues with availability of supply they might have issues with pricing etc so sometimes they can also impact the reliability of a charger when there's electricity disconnected for whatever reason. So next up we've got site owners. Now these guys are usually less active, would you believe it or not, in the overall experience that we have at charges. So they might just have site access or site safety responsibilities. Um, as I mentioned before, some of these are all the same organisation, but quite often they're not. So for instance here at IKEA, they'd be just looking to make sure there's clear access uh, to the car parks, there's no safety issues, etc. But pretty much other than that, they're not too worried about the charger reliability. Now we come down to the charger owners. So these are the people that have actually stumped up 100 to 150,000 plus to put the hardware in. 
So the charger we showed you before, they're about $150,000 installed, so they are quite expensive each. So these guys have a vested interest in the return on investment of the charger. So yes, they put the charger in, but then they're worried about whether they've got the financial income coming in to maintain the charger. Now this ownership model is often very fragmented. Most chargers I'd argue in Australia probably aren't economical at some of the prices that are charged at the moment. And also the owners or the operators don't necessarily have economies of scale because they don't have that many chargers in. Now again, some of these guys are active or not. So you've got the Ampoles and the BPs coming into the world with the recent government funding. So they'll be obviously more active um, owners than some of the other ones will. Whereas you've got universities, etc. cetera, that um, hats off to the unis. They were the first ones to put in a lot of EV charging uh, over 10 years ago. Um, but those guys are a lot more passive. They've put it in at a couple of their university campuses. They're often free, they don't charge for them. So they're less incentivized to actually keep those charges maintained and operational. So the elephant in the room for charger owners is the service and maintenance contracts that go in with those charges. So lots of people put charges in and there's a lot of headlines etc but unfortunately the service and maintenance contracts often aren't sitting behind those charges and there's a reason for that often because there's a cost to it and as i mentioned the return on investment or the viability of charges in australia at the moment is not that great so i see this as one of the prime reasons for poor charger reliability and availability in australia is charging is just not profitable. So let's have a look at the physical charger itself. So here we're talking about the hardware, the software inside the charger, and also the payment gateway. So if it's not a free charger, it'll have a payment gateway, so you can pay your money. So those three components make up the actual charger that stands in front of you when you go to plug in. So first up, let's look at the hardware. So the quality of the hardware or the robustness of the hardware, aging and the continual heavy use, all these have been problems recently. So with increased temperatures in our area here in Australia and increased colder temperatures overseas, the robustness of the technology has really come out. So there's lots of charger manufacturers that are having to go back to the R&D boards because their chargers are just not coping with the extreme heat and the extreme cold that is happening more and more often. Aging as well. So when we're talking about a lot of these uh, chargers that have been around for a while, as I mentioned, we've got universities here in Australia, the chargers are over 10 years old. So they've had quite a hard life and they're at probably, I'd argue, the end of life and they're becoming used more and more given more EVs on the road. So again, they're starting to fail. Now, some of the manufacturers that we've got here in Australia with chargers around is obviously Tritium. So most people will know Tritium. It's a Brisbane-based company. But uh, over 12 months ago, they listed on the NASDAQ in the US and they have primarily, I'd argue, now a US focus. Um, the US tax uh, system is now really promoting uh, manufacturing locally onshore in the US. So Tritium have built massive big new manufacturing uh, plants over there. And they're really focusing on that growth stage and probably not on spare parts um, and availability as much as what they should do. Delta is another uh, charger manufacturer, ABB, Siemens and Kempower. And if you'd like to check out one of the first Kempower chargers in Australia, I'll put a link to that above. I went and checked that out at Mount Omni Shopping Centre recently. Now also on the hardware, the install locations are important, so we need to be trying to cover them better to protect them from the elements. And you'll notice a lot of chargers don't have any cover or protection from the weather, so that's impacting. And they're becoming more and more powerful and more complex. So we started out with around 50 kilowatts was the most common. Now we're moving up to 150 kilowatts and there's a lot of 350 kilowatt chargers around now. So they're massive chargers, a lot of electronics in them. They generate a lot of heat, etc. So all that is also um, adding to the pressure on the hardware manufacturers. We mentioned the availability of parts. So yeah, these are companies that are manufacturing chargers. They potentially need more parts on shore. And I know we can't use the excuse of the, um, the COVID supply chain issues forever. So that's starting to wear a little bit thin. So the guys just need to get more parts. So yeah, the quality of the hardware 
and how it's maintained is another key part of the reliability issues we've got. So let's take a look at software. So hardware is no good without software. So the basic operational software to make the charger work. So this is the plug and play type stuff. Um, that talks to the car, so it communicates to the car. It's the most basic um, part of the software in it. Then we've got the diagnostic and um, problem solving hardware, which sits inside the charger. And then there's custom built reporting, monitoring, remote access, and demand and supply type software. So each charger has software, multiple different types of software in it to do different things. So again, that adds a layer of complexity. Um, one of those software has a bug in it and it can bring the whole thing down. The payment gateway, this is the other one. So this is where you swipe your credit card, you use your payment app. So that's what we call user authentication. So generally the charge won't start until it authenticates with your account and it says, great, we can match the car with the account, we match it with the cost of the charge and away it goes. So that also is a area of complexity. Now here in Queensland, ChargeFox is a main provider of this service. Now they've been around since 2017. They're also a network owner, but they do provide third party payment operator functions, which is what we'll have a look at at our example shortly with the Queensland Electric Super Highway Network. And finally, we've got the maintenance service providers, the support agreements, all that sort of stuff. So. Firstly, we need to have a maintenance and a support agreement in place with the uh, EV charger owner to make sure that when the thing goes down, they can get it fixed. But then the reliability and the capability of those guys, when you call them up and say, hey, my charger's down, I need you to come and fix it. They've had staffing issues. There's also a lack of training and development in the uh, engineer, electrical engineering and technology space. So that's causing a challenge. And also this is a reasonably immature market in Australia and we've got, as everyone knows, a rather large land mass. So we've got charges spread all over the country with a limited number of qualified service personnel. So they're traveling all over the place, potentially needing parts and other things that they need to carry with them. So again, that's another area that makes this complex and adds to the problems. Okay, so we've listed all the components and the organizations involved and why we're having so many problems. So let's actually put it in a practical perspective and look at an example. So the Queensland Electric Super Highway, put in by the Queensland Government, it's a, it's a great um, facility. We use it quite a lot. We live in Queensland, as our regular viewers will know. It is quite a good network, um, reasonably priced. We've got multiple videos where we've done road trips and travel using the network, so we'll include those above and also in the show notes. But looking at the actual example from publicly available information I can get, the owner of this network is the Queensland Government, and they managed it through the Department of Transport and Main Roads, so they commissioned the um, build of the actual network. The build manager, so these are the guys that actually went out and bolted the charges down and built it. That was Eureka, so that also is a government owned corporation here in Queensland, it's part of Energy Queensland. They designed, built and maintained the network of DC rapid charges across the state. The manufacturer of the hardware they use, so this is the actual charges and we've seen one here earlier in the uh, video is tritium and we talked about how they've recently listed on the u.s share market and their focus may not be australia uh, at this point in time but they manufacture the actual hardware the payment gateway so this is the guys that you swipe your rfd or you use the app is chargefox so that's why i mentioned chargefox don't own this network the queensland government do but they provide the third party uh, payment gateway for it. So they look after the authentication, the billing, and they also do the customer call center. So on every one of these charges, if there's a fault with it or an error, the number on there is ChargeFox. So you report it through ChargeFox, and then there's obviously some sort of maintenance agreement in the background, which I don't have visibility to, um, but that would kick in the uh, maintenance, a call's made, and then the charges get fixed. And the final party within the electric superhighway is the branding. So from a user's perspective, keep in mind 
This is us EV drivers and people that are thinking about buying an EV. They're not interested in all that complication behind the scene. So they rock up to one of these chargers. They see the Eureka brand on it. They see the Charge Fox brand on it. They see the RACQ brand on a lot of them. So it is very confusing. So this is why people just don't understand what the hell is going on in this whole ecosystem. They just want a reliable charging network. So just from that example, you can see how complex it is. And if you're being cynical, you could say that there's lots and lots of opportunities for buck passing. And as we mentioned, we're not picking out one particular network. We use the Queensland Electric Superhighway as an example. However, this happens with all the other networks. But with that complexity, there's lots and lots of opportunities for somebody to blame somebody else and for delays to happen. Okay, so let's sum up the five things which I think are most critical to the poor reliability we're experiencing at the moment. So number one, we've got a fragmented, complex operating and ownership model of DC rapid charging. We've got a problem with charger hardware robustness parts availability and harsh operating climates. There's been a lack of focus on service contracts and maintenance agreements to maintain the charges after they've been installed. There's been poor historical planning for EV charging, location and facilities, so not enough thoughts gone into planning these things. And the final one, which is being talked about more and more because a lot of countries are introducing this, is there's no minimum uptime standards, guarantees or penalties for having a non-operational network and there's also no centralised reporting area. So recently in the US they're looking at if you've got any sort of charger network there's a reliability uh, guarantee that you must meet which is a bit of a no-brainer and I'm really surprised that when we're giving away taxpayer money we're not building these things into the agreements. So if we're handing money to organisations there needs to be a commitment that these charges that they put in are going to be maintained and available for the EV charging public. Well, we've looked at all the negatives, all the things that are wrong, things that aren't working. So on a positive note, let's have a look at how we could actually make this better. And I really wanna hear your thoughts. So there's lots of passionate discussions on this. So if you leave your comments in the comments section, I'll uh, attempt to reply to as many of those as I can. And also it helps the EV community. So make sure you put those comments in. But from my perspective, some of the ones I came up with, EV drivers need to keep reporting non-operational charges. So ring the number that's on the charger, email the charger, email the uh, site owner, whether that be a council or a shopping centre, and put it on PlugShare. So if it's non-operational, put it up on PlugShare, and I'll put a screenshot of this particular charger here today not working, and you'll be able to see the comments EV drivers put up. But that's really important, so we call this out. EV drivers probably need to pay a little bit more. As I mentioned, most of our charging's done at home. So these are convenience charges. When you need them, you need them to work. So I'm quite happy to pay more for my charge on the guarantee that the charge is gonna be working when I rock up. And the other one from an EV driver's perspective, understand that 80% rule. So EVs will generally charge really quickly up to 80% and once they hit that 80% they slow right down and that last 20% of charge often takes the same amount of time to get from say 20% to 80%. So if you're not on a road trip with a small battery EV and you don't need that last bit of charge, unhook, leave the charger and let that charger become available to somebody else. That will free up the networks a little bit. The other thing is we need a better return on investment for the charger owners. Now Jolt, uh, there's no Jolt chargers in Queensland, but there's uh, some I know in New South Wales. They provide free charging for drivers with a big advertising panel beside it. So it's like a giant uh, screen TV. So you can plug in and, and I'm assuming they think that you're gonna sit there or maybe it's the walking uh, pedestrians going past. So the advertising is paying for the charger. Either way, if it's a reliable charger, that's great. Lower network and electricity costs. So this is something, we won't go into it too much in this uh, video, but some of the network connection fees are extraordinary. Uh, the network operators are charging the charger owners as if every charger is running at 100% capacity all the time. 
So for instance, the gold plating, the infrastructure that needs to plug into those chargers, which is totally not required these days. There's electronics and software packages that can manage that load. So those guys really need to get on board and lower the um, entry bar, I guess, for uh, charger owners. Charger type. So I mentioned before that chargers start at about $100,000, $150,000. But there's a lot of locations now that are getting really big chargers, like 350 kilowatt chargers. Now, personally, I'd argue that this is a bit of overkill. Those chargers are very expensive to buy. The infrastructure, as I said, the, the cables to run into them, very expensive from the network operators. Little cars like this one, we can only charge at a maximum of 75 kilowatts. So we don't need all these massive big chargers. Let's get a better mix of chargers spread around the place. We need better coordination and planning from all the parties involved. So if um, there's a way that that can happen, that will also make things a lot better. We need to look at not putting them in areas that are prone to flooding. Here in Queensland, that had a huge impact on our reliability. A lot of the chargers or the charging infrastructure was in areas that flooded. So of course they were out of action for six. We had a chargers here in Queensland out of action for over 12 months. Um, so let's be a bit more sensible about where we put them and how we protect the infrastructure. Manufacturers need to improve the onshore parts availability. We talked about that. And government and industry also need to sort out some sort of panelly and reliability system. So again, we touched on that one. So have I missed anything? Do you agree with what we've talked about today? Really looking forward to hearing your comments. So in closing, we should quickly talk about how you find out what charges are working and what aren't. So we talked about Tesla before, really easy in their environment because it's on the app or it's in the car. It will tell you the charges that are working and not, and it's live and it's always up to date, so nice and accurate. With all the other networks, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Some of the networks have live data and their apps are quite good. Other networks don't have any functionality within their apps to tell you that. So in those cases, probably look to PlugShare. So the good old PlugShare app, it is community-based, so it's not always accurate and it's not live, but it relies in Australia on EV drivers checking in on PlugShare and saying this charge is working or it's not working or it's slow. Um, so as we said before, we put that screenshot shot up there you'll see how those EV drivers put that in and they said that this charger here at Logan wasn't working. So that's it for another video. Thanks very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a look in the show notes. I've put some links to a lot of the stuff we've talked about today and there's also a couple of great reports in there. One from the Electric Vehicle Council and also some interesting reading on EV charger reliability in the UK. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you can spare a couple of dollars to help us out on the channel, you'll see the donation platforms and support platforms down below. And the links to those are also in the show notes. And remember, you can give a one-off small donation, or if you are so inclined, you can support us with a monthly sponsorship or membership. And by doing that, you'll get also extra lurks and perks. So you can check out Patreon for that. You can check out YouTube memberships, which we've just launched, and also Kofi memberships. Every little bit helps. As you can imagine, all the gear we use is quite expensive. We've got mics, we've got tripods, we've got cameras, we've got editing software, all that sort of stuff starts to add up. So every dollar helps. And look, if you can't spare any cash, that's fine. Just make sure you click that subscribe button and give us a thumbs up because those free, easy ways also really, really help out the channel. So until the next video, take care, stay safe, look after your friends and family, and we'll talk soon.